everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the our final uh, uh, a speaker in our Hispanic Heritage Month uh, series. It's been an amazing month so far. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to wait uh, a minute or so before we get started because we want to give people a chance to enter the webinar. Um, it has been such a pleasure uh, helping and moderating these uh, with our chairperson, uh, Mrs. Christine Benitez. I will be your moderator for the evening. Um, in a minute, we're gonna get started. We have our speaker here, Mr. Dean Flores, who will be our final speaker in our series uh, this month. So um, it, as somebody of Latinx descent, I am super proud to be a part of this community and to be a part of the Glendale Unified School District. And so I'm really pleased to, to be here this evening. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, Senora Alfaro Rosas, could you please do our introduction? Thank you. Okay. Can you give me the box where I can click Spanish? I didn't get it. There okay, great, perfect. Thank you. Can you give us our introduction? So right now she is giving instructions for those of you uh, who would like interpretation in Spanish to please click our interpretation button. We're gonna go ahead and uh, move forward as she's doing that. Uh, right now, we'd also like to uh, introduce and welcome our superintendent, Dr. Vivian Echian. Dr. Echian, please. Good afternoon, students, parents, community members. Welcome to our speaker series. It's such a privilege to be part of our process to have individuals, valuable individuals in our community who are role models for all of us, including our students of Latinx heritage, come and speak about their experiences growing up and the work that they do now and how this work unites us and our efforts to create a culture and climate in our schools that is inclusive and welcoming. Welcome, Mr. Flores. We're so happy to have you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Mr. Gallimore, we cannot hear you. Boy, thanks. I sounded really good to myself. Thank you, Dr. Etchian. We'd like to thank all of our speakers, uh, of which Mr. Flores is the final speaker this month for us. Um, we'd also like to thank the people that connected us to those speakers. Uh, Ms. Beatrice Bautista, Ms. Yvonne, Yvonne Quinones, Anita Quinones Gabrielian, and Jenny Quinones Skinner. Also, we'd like to thank our chairperson, Christine Benitez, and the Glendale Unified School District, who's done always done an amazing job to support the work of Adelante Latinos and help us move forward. And speaking of moving forward, we'd also like to thank the Glendale Latino Association for always being there and sponsoring us. And this year, and hopefully moving forward, these, this uh, speaker series is co-sponsored uh, by the Glendale Public Libraries. Um, and we'd also like to thank the members of the Adelante Latinos Committee. And as we've been doing the speaker series this past month, we've had been uh, blessed to have some student moderators, uh, Samantha Villasenor, Jesse Guzek, Sidney Esquivel, and Michael Gonzalez has helped us along the way. Uh, we have a social media page, as you can see, we are, we are really trying to get our message out there. Um, all of these are here. Um, it's okay if you can't get them written down really fast, we'll make this recording uh, available for you on our YouTube page. Um, and speaking of our YouTube page, we have been uh, filming every single one of these speaker series uh, events, and we are gonna add our final speaker, speaker series here at the end. Mr. Flores, you can look for that this evening. Um, Mr. Flores is, has graciously agreed to be our final speaker in this series, and it has been an amazing, amazing year so far. Uh, also, those of you that are interested in joining our community, it's not, it, uh, Adelante Latinos started as, as a 
as a district committee, but we are trying to expand and get more members of the community involved. We're going to have our next strategic planning meeting uh, Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. And if you're interested in this or any other information, please visit our website, which is www.gusd.net slash adelante. We will have this information there for you. Um, I'm going to be your host for this evening, and I would like to introduce, and I'll give you some background, Mr. Flores. He's former California State Senate Majority Leader, founder, as CEO of Balanced Public Relations Incorporated. Mr. Flores is the founder and CEO of Balanced Public Relations, a full-service strategic consulting firm that provides private and public clients where innovation and regulation intersect. Dean is a seasoned government relations professional with over three decades of experience and prior service in the California legislature. He is an expert at guiding established and startup tech companies throughout the regulatory processes and spaces. Uh, everybody, please welcome with me, Mr. Dean Flores. Thank you, sir. Thank you, I appreciate that. Can you guys hear me okay? I hear you very well, thank you. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for having me tonight. I feel privileged and congratulations, Superintendent. Thank you for putting all this together and, and the entire team. Uh, Adelante Latino's amazing uh, work. And I can only say it, I looked at the list of speakers prior to my coming on at the end. And I hope I can just do the justice to a great group of folks you've had. Um, by way of introduction, uh, again, I'm Dean Flores. I was born and raised uh, in the Central Valley. And most of who I am today is kind of centered on that fact. So I want to take you through a bit of a journey, kind of how I got to where I'm at today. Uh, and more importantly, uh, where I see some similarities among the Latino community in terms of where they can go and how far they can go. And, and obviously it's boundless, but I think there's some lessons to be learned in terms of some of the, what I call intrinsic DNA that we have. Uh, and not to say that others don't, but I, I just feel um, there's some, some things I will mention during my, my quick chat. So again, I was uh, born and raised in the Central Valley. My parents uh, were born and raised in the Central Valley. And the Central Valley from, from Glendale is about two hours down the uh, I-5 into the Central Valley and a left at uh, Laredo Highway, which is a little town called Chapter, California. Chapter is a predominantly farm worker uh, community. Uh, most of the area, it's been around about 100 years, but it, it's between Bakersfield and Delano, or now if you're thinking of LA, maybe Fresno. But uh, it's become somewhat famous only because we're the town next door or somewhat close to McFarland, California, which was you know great fanfare, great movie uh, on the community. And all of those communities in the Central Valley are somewhat similar. So I um, you know, can tell you that uh, one of the core similarities between all the communities there is that they are truly farm working communities, meaning the farm workers who are putting our food on our table every day and picking everything that we're eating in the world, uh, all center around this part of the Central Valley. And uh, this is kind of where my, my great grandmother and my grandmother uh, made their home. Obviously they followed the fields and found a place in this town called the Mexican Colony in Chapter, California and created a, a small community there. I mean, people would, would traveling the fields, following the harvest, found a group of farmers that felt that their work was good enough to continue on and stay and not just follow the fields, but kind of stay around the farms, uh, even during some of the off season. So uh, I, I'm kind of a descendant of one of those families. Uh, and we located ourselves in, in this Colonia. And as, as most of you probably know, Colonia in the Central Valley is a, pretty much an unincorporated area. Most of it is, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, no, no sidewalks. Uh, you know, very early in growing up, no, no running water, outhouses, you know, the kind of things that you would think about early, not in the early 70s, but, you know, probably way in the 40s and 30s. But it, it is a truly interesting community that I, that I came from, that I was raised in. Uh, my, my mom and dad both uh, worked very hard to get out of the fields. Uh, my mom became a, a teller at the only bank in this little town at Shafter, a population of about 10,000. And uh, my dad left the fields to work in a manufacturing plant in nearby Bakersfield. 
both very hardworking parents. Um, to give you a sense of who they are, I think my mom retired from the bank 30 years later. Uh, my dad retired from his job uh, some 30 years into it. They were very happy to have, uh, in some sense, jobs outside of the fields, worked very, very hard to raise us, myself and my sister, um, in this town. And uh, one of the common aspects of the town was sports. So I was uh, very much involved in sports as a youth, uh, did everything you'd probably do in a small town, very participated in just about everything from student government to choir to football, basketball, track and field. Um, really kind of the town is truly a unique one high school town. Um, very, even though there were farmers and farm workers in the town and there was a dividing line, uh, a railroad that kind of ran in between the town, um, the lines uh, began to get blurred as the population, the Latino population grew. And I think I was just at the beginning of that. I think when my dad went to Shafter High School, because he also went to Shafter High School, there must have been 10% Latinos. I think when I went to Shafter High School, it must have been something close to 30. Uh, when my son went to Shafter High School, Sean, it was more like 80% Latino, which was not too long ago. And so it's it's the town has seen transformation obviously, but, um, you know, there was a lot of goodwill, um, even in that town, even between farmers and farm workers, their kids, in some sense, all playing on the same teams. So I, I got a really good grounding, I think, um, there. Um, I, like any kid there, you know, really didn't think about college. My parents didn't go to college at all. I mean, they both graduated from high school. Um, as I mentioned, they were just super happy to have a middle-class job if you will, a manufacturing job and a bank job. Um, and it was pretty much clear to me that uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to go to college or not. Uh, just it isn't in our family. And I thought really hard about it. I, I thought maybe I'd go and play sports. And uh, I just, you know, if I told you, if I told you I was going to go to UCLA when my junior or sophomore year, I probably said there's no way. Um, maybe Fresno State, maybe uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which are kind of the valley town colleges uh, where I grew up. But I was really fortunate that um, we actually got KTLA in, in the Central Valley. So we got a chance and a glimpse at Los Angeles almost every night, uh, some two hours away. But um, it was very interesting when um, I did graduate from high school. Um, I had an unfortunate break of my leg in football. That was a real wake-up call for me. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life as a senior in high school. So I did what most people do. I, um, I thought long and hard about it. I went to Bakersfield College, which was the community college right next to us. I uh, ended up figuring out I actually liked school. I took one course in political science, got an A in it, and felt very, very uh, happy. I never really got a lot of A's in high school. Um, and just kind of thought, maybe I can have a brain, maybe I can do this work, maybe I can, maybe I'm made for college. And uh, within that one year at community college, I ended up getting amazing grades, um, studied really hard, and decided that I would try to transfer. I mean, literally after the first year. And the normal thing for a kid from the Central Valley is to go to Fresno State or go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And for whatever reason, just watching KTLA and watching the UCLA basketball team almost every Saturday night, I just felt like I wanted to apply to UCLA, which was a really interesting thing for my family because we, we didn't trek to LA too much. Um, you know, it's a very self-contained community. The, Bakersfield is the largest city and Fresno is probably the second largest city uh, that you travel to. So to go over the hill, if you will, to UCLA was a, a real interesting paradigm shift for my parents, even for myself. So uh, I can tell you, I applied to UCLA and I got in. I was very happy to get in. I was very scared. I was very worried. Um, I knew I was going to a huge university. And more importantly, I knew I was going to a town that had over a two-story building, which Shafter doesn't have. And um, it was a really interesting uh, time in my life. It's like the early 80s. And, you know, I've never really been out of the Central Valley. And to go to an institution like UCLA was very uh, frightening. 
uh, I was really, really worried that I wouldn't make it out of there. And just every class that I took in my first quarter there was like tape recorded. I'd come home and transcribe it in my on my little Sony cassette tape. And I was terrified that I wasn't going to make it out of this institution. And I think I just studied really, really hard my first quarter and ended up getting straight A's, which was a, another mind blowing thing for me to be at a university of that size and to be kind of an unknown. As a transfer student, you really don't go through the freshman experience. You don't get to live in the dorms. Um, you don't get to get, you know, brought into the university the way that uh, most people do. You're just kind of like a transfer student and you're expected to be in class and show up. And I, and I lived in Van Nuys, which is not too far away. And I drove to UCLA in this pickup truck and uh, for the first quarter, just kept my head down, worked really hard. And uh, like anything, um, next quarter led to even better grades. Pretty soon it was my sophomore year, as I call it, because I had just transferred after a year at community college and uh, was getting amazing grades. And then I got involved in student government. I just got involved in high school, as I mentioned, small town, Everyone got involved in everything. And uh, I got involved in government at UCLA and uh, ran for student council with a bunch of friends helping me, mostly from Mecha and from a lot of other Latino based groups. I was in a group called Latino Pre-Law because I wanted to go to law school at that point. And uh, we decided to run for student council in a very big school and I won. And then the next year I ran for student body president and I became student body president of UCLA, which was like an amazing experience coming from a transfer student, got very involved at the university, um, extremely involved in the campus politics of the day. Uh, and I think that was kind of my, my introduction to politics, true politics, not student government politics, but larger. UCLA was such a big institution and so connected to the world. Um, I got to meet a lot of interesting politicians in, in LA uh, and in California as student body president. And then I felt pretty fortunate to graduate uh, really, really, with really amazing grades. Um, so it was a fantastic turnaround experience for me. I always say UCLA was just like, changed my entire experience. Just that higher education experience was amazing. And uh, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. So obviously I studied for the LSAT, I was going to go to law school and that was going to be, you know, kind of my next track. And I uh, ended up applying for a Senate fellowship uh, at the, in the California State Legislature. It just caught my eye, one of these pamphlets that you find when you're going through the Career Center. And I thought, boy, that was really interesting to go to Sacramento and spend a year as a Senate fellow and working for a senator and being on staff. And so I applied and I got in. And I took a trek to Sacramento and I got to work for a person, a uh, senator from Los Angeles, uh, Senator Art Torres at that time. And uh, he was an amazing mentor. It was a time when in the state Senate, in the California state Senate at that time, there were only three Latino state senators um, and he was one of them. And I thought, so I was so privileged to work for somebody who had worked in Los Angeles and been around the LA community, been a senator. You know, it was just an amazing, been ex it was an assemblyman before that. And so I really found a love for politics and I ended up staying there for about three or four years working. And after, even after my fellowship ended, I, I loved politics and I really, really was interested in, in the state Senate particularly. And um, I worked on a ton of campaigns like we all do. Um, I got sent down to some amazing campaigns um, I worked everywhere from Los Angeles to San Jose to San Diego, uh, became very, very uh, politically active uh, in that, those days uh, as a staff member. And then ultimately um, had to make a decision about four or five years later. I, I thought I, you know, I want to go on in my higher, higher education career. I'd spent about three or four years there now and, and law school seemed so I don't know, it just seemed like three years at that point in my life. I just didn't know if I wanted to do it. So I ended up um, applying to business school and don't ask me why. I've been frightened of math, uh, terrified of statistics, uh, tried to avoid everything that even looked like that at UCLA. I, I stuck to the political science world and the social sciences. So applying to business school was an interesting thing. and. Um, 
I applied to Harvard Business School and never thinking I would get into Harvard. And, but I had an inkling, I had great grades at UCLA. Uh, I did student body president there. I worked in the state Senate, but I didn't think they'd take me because I'm sure that they would look at my math courses and say, boy, this person's just not gonna be able to compete here at the Harvard Business School. But for whatever reason, they took me in and uh, I took my first Trillo trip out of the state and moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston and found myself at the West Point of capitalism, meaning um, a super, super conservative school with very, very conservative uh, young people uh, all around 28, 29, 30. Um, all of had worked in business world. I'd worked in politics. They had worked in the business world. So I, I kept thinking to myself, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but um, certainly was happy to be there. And like anything, just like I did at UCLA, I just kept my head down and worked extremely hard to understand all of the cases and all of the things that we had to do at the business school and did well. I, I know I, I really took to it. I do think my colleagues, uh, my fellow classmates at Harvard Business School learned a lot more from me than I probably learned from them. It's a very interactive school and they got to learn about farm worker experience, they got to learn about labor unions, they got to learn about, you know, what it means to be Latino in, in California, and what it means to be an ethnic minority, in some sense, in those days, and why some policies were just important, where, where they might think, you know, these wouldn't be important, and in some sense, different from their philosophy. So the Harvard Business School was very different, because it was not, it was very different to California legislature, where you know, everyone around you, at least in the party, was very similar in thinking and philosophy. The business school was a lot of conservative folks, uh, you know, mostly, um, you know, in the Republican side of the world. And I was a kind of a Democrat and worked in politics for many years. So it was a good learning experience for me to be at the Harvard Business School, to be around very conservative folks, to understand how they thought how they operated, how they viewed the world. And then to step out of California was amazing to just be on the East Coast for a couple of years. Business school is a two year program. I don't know if I could have done it any longer than that. It's very cold and lots of snow. And I certainly wasn't used to that. Uh, but nonetheless, I left Harvard Business School um, two years later and I really wanted to get back to California. And I really wanted to get back to Los Angeles because it felt like this would be a great place for me, not Sacramento, but to come to this amazing city that we have with so much diversity. I was just really, really wanting to do that. And I was fortunate that I found an investment bank firm of three African-American founders who had hit the glass ceiling at each of their respective investment banks in New York. And they created their own firm. They just said, hey, we're going to be you know, create our own firm. And, and uh, they were looking for someone to run an LA office and I fit the bill. So I started uh, my career as, as an investment banker here in Los Angeles, uh, doing municipal finance for a great firm with three great founders. Uh, the founders were based in Philadelphia, New York and Atlanta. And I was the LA office. And I thought that was an amazing experience. Um, and I worked as an investment banker here for a bit. And then, uh, like anything, um, I talked to my friends who were still in politics and they lured me back in and I wanted to kind of get lured back in and to maybe thinking about running for office, but not running for office in Los Angeles, but hopefully going back home to the Central Valley where I just, I think I told you we've lived a long time. My family's been there a long time. But, you know, the Central Valley is a very conservative place um, as Harvard Business School was. But I was kind of used to that now. I wasn't really shying away from the conservative nature of these districts. Um, I knew my chances were very slim when I moved back home to Shafter, California from LA. Um, my wife is from Los Angeles, so I had to convince her to come down. And, you know, she's an Angelina and she is, you know, born and raised here. And if you're born and raised in LA, it's just a certain feeling. So it was hard for her, I think, to, in some sense to come down and, and but I told her I didn't think we'd win. We ran against the sitting incumbent uh, Republican assemblyman who was already in the state legislature. And um, this election was in 1998. And we ran a great campaign. We ran a very grassroots campaign. We organized almost all of the farm worker cities in the Central Valley that were in this assembly district. 
in a way that、uh, we used to organize in Los Angeles. So it was really interesting to come back home and apply Los Angeles organizing to Central Valley organizing. And、uh, needless to say, we won.、Um, there was only two incumbents that lost that year in the legislature, and we beat one of them. And I found myself in the state assembly, which was an amazing experience to represent your hometown. And、um, you know, as conservative as it was, we won in a very <laughs> tough seat.、Um, and then I started my assembly career. You, as you can probably guess, my priorities in the assembly, as an assemblyman, were really just two. I was very simple. I wanted to stand up for farm workers. I wanted to make sure that they had an equal playing foot、uh, field. Uh, when it came to ag- agricultural policy in the state legislature,、uh, not just farmers, but evening, evening, e- evening the, the playing field, and then also I really wanted to clean up the air in the Central Valley. It's got some of the worst air anywhere in the nation, and I just felt like nobody was talking about making sure that agriculture and others kind of brought up their standards when it came to air quality. So those were my two, you know, those were the really the things I worked on in the assembly. I, I think the first bill I carried, there were 13 farm workers that were killed in a part of my district on a foggy August day、um, or foggy September day. Like it gets starts to get foggy there in the Central Valley, and、um, you know, to a lot of people, it's just like what happens in the Central Valley. Farm workers are in vans, they're traveling to a field, they get in a wreck. People die, and for whatever reason, they, you know, it always felt like farm workers were like part of the harvest at their desk. And in this van,、um, like very similar to many vans、uh, there, what farmers would do is take out the forward-facing seats in any van, and they would retrofit it to just put in、uh, wooden benches on each side, thus making you know a six to nine passenger van something that could accommodate sixteen people. Very packed in, people sitting on benches, people sitting on、uh, paint cans, and like on this given day,、uh, August thirteenth, nineteen ninety nine, I remember it. Thirteen、um, farm workers died, and it was like normal reading to people. Like, and to me, this was like one of the things that I re- one of the reasons I wanted to get to the legislature. And I said, okay, we're going to run legislation that ends these wooden benches. And、we're not going to allow anyone else to retrofit and take seats out that have seat belts. This is just common sense. And you would have thought I would turn the world upside down in the Central Valley. People were just fighting that so hard, mostly farmers and contractors and others,、um, as hurting the agriculture community. To me, it was common sense. And since that time, and that bill was passed. Uh, was signed by Governor Davis, Gray Davis, at that time, and there's not been a death of a farm worker in a van that has any wooden benches because there are no wooden benches anymore, and safety is a much better place. And I'm always really proud of that legislation because it kind of began my trek to continue on. So then we did legislation that said if you're spraying a field <clears throat> and you spray over farm workers and they get sick. You know that they don't have to cover the cost to go to the emergency room because every somebody made a mistake and flew over them and sprayed them, or you couldn't dress down farm workers in the field and spray them down,、uh, you know, around like plastic barriers, or you couldn't like take farm workers and you know do half the things you do with them in terms of the wage base. And so most of my legislation really focused on what I call equating the playing field, making sure that farm workers. We're not just seen as implements of the harvest, but we're actually at the table with real rights and seen as real people, and have you know some protection. So that was mostly my assembly career.、Um, I then left the assembly early and ran for state senate, representing obviously a larger area. This time I got the giant metropolis of Fresno, which is a much more urban, democratic area, in which I really really enjoyed bringing Fresno into the district, and.、Um, As you can guess, I, I kept my quest on clean air and farm worker legislation,、um, and but in a bigger way. And here we, you know, we fought for overtime pay for farm workers. We we did a whole bunch of stuff in terms of just making sure they were protected、uh, on all of their pay and wage issues. And then I even furthered my,、uh, you know, ending ending a lot of practices like on clean air legislation. So that kind of was my focus.、Um, I rose into the leadership position. I became Senate Majority Leader of the California State Legislature 
Um, somewhere near the end of my Senate term, I was very thankful that my colleagues felt good about that. Um, I served along with a, a guy named Daryl Steinberg, who's our pro temp, amazing leader of the Senate. So, you know, I had an opportunity to, to have some leadership uh, at the Senate level and uh, just found myself just really, really uh, getting more immersed in politics. Finally, during term limits, I was termed out in 2010 and decided to run for Lieutenant Governor in the state of California. And uh, this was kind of a wake up call for me because I learned that even though I was the Senate Majority Leader in the state Senate, that I was still a Democrat from Bakersfield area, very small area. And I was running against some people you may have heard of, like a woman named Janice Hahn, who happens to be our supervisor here in LA County. And it, just a small name, Gavin Newsom, who had decided to run and lead the mayorship of, of San Francisco. So all three of us were in some sense going to run for Lieutenant Governor, but I uh, I just kind of felt like I wouldn't do well in that race. I, I was uh, didn't have enough votes. I look at San Francisco, and Alameda County, and I looked at LA County, and I looked at how how much name recognition both of these folks had. So I actually dropped out early in the race and supported my friend Gavin Newsom uh, for governor. And I still call him a very good friend. He's been a friend for many, many years. And I think he's doing an amazing job in a very tough, tough situation here in California. So, you know, I, I you know, that's when I stepped out of politics and uh, I turned out, I didn't want to run for supervisor or didn't want to run for city council, really didn't want to run for office at that point. I just felt like I wanted to do something different. And so I created a, a firm. And so my firm is called Balanced Public Relations. And I think it was mentioned that during the introduction, uh, most of what we, I, we our firm does is we take technology companies, new technologies and explain them to government. And I really enjoy this part of my life. It takes the, the Harvard Business School side of what I used to do there and really loved, and that is, uh, try to change uh, as much as possible government regulation when it comes to things that are new and upcoming and technologies. Um, one of my great clients right now is a, a company, I won't say their name publicly, but you know, they're trying to change child care. So if you think of you know, what they're doing, they, they'd like child care to be as easy as, you know, in some sense, going to a 24 hour fitness where, you know, even though you have one child care center that you're attached to today, you have to go to that one child care center. They want to have 40, 50 child care centers throughout LA County so that if you're moving and on the move or, or mother or dad is very busy, that you can go to the one child care center that is the same quality, same standards, same approval with an app that allows you to find a seat, find the hours you'd like, make sure your kids are going to comparable child care, good child care, but yet have it be more widespread as rather than going to the one child care center and being locked into that. Um, I've also worked with a lot of companies that are trying to break that mold. And as you can guess that all of our regulations are very locked into, <clears throat> you have to have one child care center, you have to have, you know, everything is locked around one. And we're and trying to open up the world from a technology perspective really, really interests me. Um, most of my firms are really, really focused on trying to provide access and equity. Um, and so I've really enjoyed running the firm. I really enjoy our clients. <clears throat> They're amazing technology companies kind of breaking the mold and doing amazing things. So I, I would just say a little bit more about that. I'll take some questions on it if anybody has it. The last thing I'll say is um, I, I, I am a member of the California Air Resources Board, was appointed by Kevin DeLeon, who is now our uh, city council member, uh, but he was once the president of the Senate. And so the California Air Resources Board is the board that oversees both pollution and carbon and trying to reduce the carbon footprint very much about climate change. In some sense, it's the climate change agency for California. So, um, you know, I've now been on that board for about seven years. Um, we do great work. Um, it's an amazing group to be part of, and we really are really interested in trying to move the needle in terms of bringing the climate footprint down, but more importantly, bringing pollution down in, in impacted areas near the port or Wilmington or the Central Valley. <clears throat> so that fight still continues. And I'm really happy that um, I'm on that board as well. 
So I've spoken for 37 straight minutes. I'm going to take a sip of coffee and I'm going to see if there's any questions or anything I can, I can answer. Well, Mr. Flores, I'm going to thank you so much. It's been very interesting just being able to sit here and listen to you. Right now, I'd like uh, to invite Sydney Esquivel to um, uh, uh, to turn on her camera. She'll be joining us. And hi, Sydney. Good to see you, hey, ma'am. Sydney. So, um, Sydney, we have some questions. We have some questions in the Q and A. If you'd like, um, we want to give Mr. Flores a second to get his uh, caffeine uh, infusion. And, <laughs> I got and, it. Yeah, very good. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the Q&A. Okay, so uh, you, oh, go ahead. Well, our first question, who is your greatest inspiration? Oh, definitely my dad is my greatest inspiration. Um, only because I think he, uh, I met a lot of great people in the world. You can imagine being in politics. and But my dad, and, and uh, we were just at the Dodger Giant game last night. And he's a big Giant fan. I can't, just drives me nuts because I'm a big Dodger fan. And in, and in the Central Valley, there's a line between Bakersfield and Fresno where if you're Bakersfield down, you're Dodgers. And if you're kind of Fresno up, so we live right on that border. But my dad has been uh, a great example for me of hard work. I think the one thing that has transcended my career, everything that I've done from Bakersfield college transfer student to Harvard has been, I said earlier, I think, I mean, I'm not discounting other cultures or other people, but I think Latinos have a secret DNA in them of hard work. It is like ingrained in what we do. I mean, we know what hard work is and we're not scared of it. And we step up and we just do it. And so I learned that from my dad. My dad is like the hardest worker I know. Like anybody, even today, you know, he's the hardest worker I know. So I, I really feel like he's my, my inspiration still. He's taught me what hard work is and what it takes to get to different levels. And he's always told me, like, even when I got into every school, when I got into UCLA, I was frightened. I go like, how am I gonna compete against all these kids that went to private school and these La Quinadas and all these, these Glendale schools, you know? And, I'm from like Shafter and they're just gonna, I'm not gonna make it. And he just said, Dean, you can outwork them. You know, you can work, work, work and read your readings two or three times and let, make transcripts of them, do whatever you need to do, but we're outwork. If you outwork everyone, you will be great. And I, I it's held, even when I went to the Harvard Business School, I was like, oh my God, math. Someone's gonna ask me a math question. And, you know, I really learned math, believe it or not, at Harvard Business School because I just put in extra work. And so my dad is, you know, I mean, all I can say is that he's, uh, you know, the hard work inspiration that I have. And it's been very, you know, taken me everywhere I've gone thus far. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Out of everything you have done, what do you think, um, so sorry, out of everything you have done, how do you think you've impacted our community the most? Um, I would probably say, um, and I hope this is the case, I don't mean to be like, but I, I hope that somebody in my community says that a kid from a dirt town can go to community college and then end up graduating from Harvard. That's what I hope people see because, you know, I was not getting A's in high school. <laughs> I was not, you know, I was just having fun and doing my best and you know and and I think once I got serious about things I think that that is what I you know I, I would say when people meet me I hope that they remember that you know I always tell people when I went to Harvard Business School and I met everyone they would say where'd you go to school they'd say oh I went to Brown or I went to Harvard or I went to Yale and you know everybody in this in your class and and I said oh I went to Bakersfield Community College and it, everybody would stop and say, well, well, oh, Bakersfield Community College? I said, yeah, and then I transferred to UCLA. But I'd like them to know that about me because in the real world, when they come out to be managers of the world, that they got to know that, you know, there's some potential in everyone and there's somebody working for them or there's somebody that just has the drive that can actually make that jump. You can jump from community college to a UCLA, from UCLA to a Harvard, and I think it's not canceling yourself out, just believing that 
with hard work, you can do it. And I always knew that whether it was sports or school, that I would outwork, I would outwork everyone. It would take a lot of hours. Um, I would lose a lot of hair, but I, but I knew that if I'd spend some time just reading something two or three times, that it would stick. And, and, and even today when I'm in hearings in the Senate or when I'm in the cardboard, you know, I read my binder two or three times, you know, just, I know it, I know it because I've read it not once, twice, but three times. And I, and I think that's, and again, not the same thing about Latinos, but I think we do that well. We know how to hard work and I just apply it to whatever I'm doing. And it always seems to work wonders for me. What was the struggle that you had to overcome in your career? Um, I will tell you one thing. I'll be candid with everyone here. The biggest struggle that I've had, and I still struggle with it today, is not knowing two languages well. So I grew up in a second generation. You, know, you heard me say my parents were born and raised also in the Central Valley. So their Spanish is pretty good. My grandma, my nana, everyone's Spanish. Obviously, that's all they spoke was Spanish. But I'm like third generation. So nobody like ever spoke Spanish to me. <laughs> and I never thought that was a big deal um, until literally I got to the state legislature. And I never forget this. Um, I went to speak in Arvin, California to a cafeteria full of Latinas, right? Moms who were, there was an issue about the school and the big meeting. And I never forgot that here was their, their state assemblyman, Latino, going up to a microphone and wanting, you know, and, and going to explain to them what we're going to do. And I started to talk like I am now. And someone said in Spanish. And it was like, I can't explain that feeling. One of embarrassment, one of like feeling unworthy because here are my people and I need to speak the language that they are speaking and I don't. So I would, I would say sometimes when I tell people, you know, when I do, when I used to go to class, classes and speak in schools, I would say, how many of you guys know Spanish? They would all raise their hand. In my, in my district, almost everyone raised their hands. I said, you know what, don't ever lose that, ever. Because one day <laughs> you might be a state senator or a business person or whatever else, and someone having those languages, so valuable. I think in many ways it stopped me in my career. You know, I'm so jealous of Kevin DeLeon. I listened to him. And I mean, he's the most, he, he, in fact, I always tell him he's better in Spanish than he is. In English, you know, he, he because he he has the ability to speak to people at a very core level. And I've always said that if I could go back and do it all over again, I really wish I would have, you know, the heartbreak for me is really not understanding as much as I should have that that language barrier and, and really taking to it, you know. So if anyone's listening out there and you have two languages, I'm so jealous of you because you can go all the way to Harvard Business School, you can be a state senator, but when you're in that cafeteria full of people that want to hear you talk to them the way they want to be talked to, they're your voters, and you can't, it's really, really hard. And just to add one last thing to this, what made it so tough that night was that the interpreter, and I don't mean to slide anyone here, but the interpreter was going to interpret for me, and she was a white woman. So I'm like, something is very wrong here. <laughs> Your state senator, Dean Flores, is here, and the person interpreting is, you know, I mean, it, it, it just felt everything about that night. I don't think I've ever forgotten it. it you know, it was uh, like a bright spotlight on you, and you're like, wow, you know, I mean, so no matter how much education you have, I would say if you can hold on to your language, please hold on to it because it's going to be invaluable. You can't even, you have no idea. So please hold on to it. What made you keep going when you had your doubts about getting into a certain college or running for a certain position? Um, I never really worried about the outcome. I mean, the worst that could happen would be I'd fail. And what I, I always felt like I would be more bummed that I didn't try than if I failed. 
so I would say to everyone there, if you know, like, if I just felt like everything I've done when I ran for state assembly, everyone said, oh, you're going to get killed. You're going to move to Bakersfield. You're going to the most conservative area. You're a Democrat. You're running against a Republican in the Republican area. And I just felt like I wanted to run for my hometown. And if I lost, what would be the worst of that? But I think I would really would have bothered me if I never had ran. And or if I had never applied to UCLA, I remember my friend saying, you're going to apply to UCLA, you're not going to get in. You have like a B average. I'm like, well, I went to community college and I had straight A's, so I'm going to try. And, you know, and of course, every time I did something like that, then I won or got lucky enough to be in a position. Then I got really scared because I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, like, how am I going to now I have to perform now I can't go back. I can't fail. But it, it never really stopped me to try to run for something or do something big leap because I always knew that I would hate, reg I would regret it more that I didn't try than if I had failed. That was always my test. Like, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever tried something and failed. I've failed a lot of things and tried things, but I've, you know, I've always at least said to myself, it was worth the try. If you could change one thing about your journey to get where you are today, what would you change? Speaking Spanish. <laughs> if I could just go back to my third grade and everyone in the household stopped speaking English and, and everyone speaking Spanish, I would be very, very, very happy if I could recreate that. And it would be so easy for everyone. So that would probably be it. How were you able to maintain your values, even though the people around you had different ones? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say a lot of it is my small town, uh, my parents, my cousins, everyone around me. You know, we are, um, I've, I've gone to some great universities. I met some amazing people, I've done great things. I probably have traveled all over the world now and feel very fortunate about that, but you know, like, when the Dodger Giant game's on and everyone's in the living room, it's just us, you know? So I would say the grounding I have from my family is very, nobody is that impressed by me and my family. They're proud, but not impressed, which is the way I really feel fortunate that nobody, you know, cared that I was a state senator. I think they cared that I still cared or I was still Dean or I was still the same person, you know, that I wasn't, like, you know, oh, I can't because I have to do something, you know, and, 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 and I kind of feel like that to me, I'm more fortunate that I'm around a lot of grounded people. Um, it's kind of like bad analogy, but it's like where you sit at Dodger Stadium, I'm sort of comfortable in certain areas. And I'm less comfortable, like when somebody says, oh, wait, you know, let's sit with me and we're in the greatest tickets in the world. And I look around, and I just don't feel comfortable. But when I get into like loge and above where everyone is at and you're among everyone and you're like all rooting for your team, it just feels great to be part of the community, you know, like not be singled out, not. And I like that. And I'm, and, and I'm feel fortunate that people around me, particularly my wife, it will you know, I remember coming back from the legislature on really tough nights and, and, and very political, be on TV all the time. And, and I'd say, oh, let me tell you all this. And I would tell her and she'd go, that's great. But you know what? You haven't thrown the trash out yet. So you need to go do that. So it's like, oh, reality. Yeah, OK, I'm going to go do that right now. So I, I'm around those type of people and I really feel fortunate for it. What is your biggest accomplishment so far? Um, I, I think my work for farm workers is my proudest. I mean, I, I always think that if I ever, I think I've told my wife this and my daughter, um, you know, if, if I ever had like a gravestone, all I want you to put is friend of the farm workers. That's my, that's my passion. I mean, I, I feel like farm workers are the least seen, the hardest working, you know, without a voice. Um, so for me, my anything I could have done in the legislature to get farm workers to a better position, and I did a lot of legislation on that, and I'm very, very proud of it. Um, you know, anything that can take farm workers to that level is definitely, you know, kind of 
my my highlight. Sorry, name the Come top on. five important things that got you to where you are. Uh, top five. That's uh, my dad, my parents, my family, as a category, and then I would say um, the people I've been surrounded with, because you kind of are who you hang out with. You really are, and um, I'm very, very fortunate to hang around people that are very positive. Um, you know, yeah, we have a lot of negative, <laughs> like every family. You know, there's always some negative, but I think generally people. Uh, feel fortunate to be around people who always said you can do it. You know, you can do it. Just keep trying, and you can do it. Um, I also feel fortunate that I've met people who I've actually changed their paradigm on the way they see Latinos and the way they interact. I always love to walk into a room of really snooty people, and and they say, "Oh, so who are you?" And I say, oh, "I'm Dean Flores." And they go, "Oh, so what have you done?" And I said, "Oh, I." You know, I I was a past state senator, and I go, oh, and I said, oh, and I went to Harvard, oh, and I, you know, and and just sometimes I like doing that because I feel like I can see their paradigm shifting from their yes, we are here and we're at your level and we can't compete, and in fact, sometimes we can out compete, and I I enjoy that because sometimes like you can imagine and. You know, you can hear some really snooty conversations at some really at some crazy tables. Things people say sometimes are mind blowing. You know, um, and I I like to make sure that they understand that there are Latinos and Latinas and others, all of us as a community. You know, we are um, the future. Honestly, I mean, my gosh, I mean. But that the, that that we are not in the just the, the, the way sometimes they have an opportunity to think that we are. There are there are a lot of us moving in these all these directions. So I like the paradigm shift. I, I enjoy that. I mean, I don't do it to throw out, but I can see when somebody needs a paradigm shift. I really, I really can. You know. So. What are what are some examples of how your current firm has changed regulations? Uh, well, I think right now I, we're working on the childcare thing, but uh, I'll give you a, some of my favorite ones are, you know, like, I don't know where everybody's at on these gig workers and Uber drivers and these things, but, you know, I kind of feel like with the right support that this has changed the whole nature of the way people work. I think it's valuable, but in, we need more protections, but I feel like we've worked a lot on regulations that allow people to have a second job. And to have another opportunity to make dollars beyond what they're only were used to, so I am a kind of a big gig economy type of person, um, and I know that rubs people right or wrong. I'm I'm actually the good gig economy person because I want everyone to have rights and workers should have protections, etc. But I don't want to take their jobs away either. You know, I feel like um, even my son drives for Uber and he works. You know, and I watch him. Like he's like, I need gas money. I gotta go drive for three three hours, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know. And, and so I I feel like the work that we've done to help change the laws for the, that type of worker, that type of economy, is a very valuable thing. It's not necessarily within the democratic, you know, structure sometimes, but I think the more of us who are working to change those laws to make them more valuable, protect workers at the same time, that's that's the important thing. Was it scary to leave home having not ever experienced a big city? Well, first it was scary to see a building over two stories. It was like frightening.、Um, second, it was interesting to be at UCLA and to learn about things I'd never heard of. I didn't know what a bagel was. I mean, everyone in LA seemed to know what a bagel was, and I never knew what a bagel was. And 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 I remember、uh, thinking to myself as a very Young unmarried man on, on a big campus. I remember、um, looking on the quad one day and telling a friend of mine who was in class I made a friend with. I said, "Wow, I can't believe these Latinas are the best dressed Latinas I've ever seen in my life." And then they have to explain to me that they were Armenian. And I was like, "What's Armenian?" And so all of these experiences coming from a very small, sheltered Latino. I mean. Farm worker, farmer, no diversity whatsoever, other than brown and white. 
to go to UCLA and to learn all this stuff like live like I mean people must have thought man who where did this guy come from like and then and more importantly for a Latino from the Central Valley to meet a Latino or Latina from East LA that was really interesting <laughs> because it 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 was such a different cultural change from an urban Latino or Latina to a rural urban urban you know it was just so much stuff and and I would say that all of that happened within my first two years at UCLA it was just you know I I look back and I, I'm sure they all thought where in the heck did this guy come from that he doesn't know all these things but that was very interesting what is the most racist racist experience that you have or had been victim during your career of life well, I think when I ran for the state assembly, um, I remember this parade that my wife and I and my son were in, and we were going through. I was running against a Republican in a Republican town, and you know, but I remember going through a Christmas parade and people chanting "Bean Flores," not "Dean Flores," and I just just threw me off that they would like kind of beaner and bean and having my signs changed to Bean Flores, you know, and, 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 and that was, that was like, to me, it just kind of said people have a lot to learn still, you know, that, you know, there were still inherently racist types of thought processes, of particularly a Latino running. I mean, there had never been a Latino in the Central Valley elected. I should say there had never been a state senator elected in the Central Valley where a lot of Latinos live, you know, ever. We were the first and, you know, in that sense, I think it was difficult to see kind of the, the mentality of a lot of these folks come out so blatantly. Um, and remember, this is Trump. This is Trump country, right? This is like, this is where Trump won. And, you know, I always tell people that we won in the district that Obama always lost. So it tells you that this was a very, very tough district that had a lot to learn. But I think in my 12 years representing everyone there, they learned a lot seeing us and the work that we did. And hopefully it did some, some attitudes changed as well. That's what I'm hopeful for, so. Sydney, if you could ask one last question, please, to, to close out, that'd be great. Okay, I think our last question should be, how do you define success? Um, if you've worked hard enough and if you fail, I would say that that's success. I hope that makes sense. But I really feel like if you have put everything you can into something and you didn't make it, I really truly think you've actually succeeded. And the next thing you do will be probably work, but I would say that Success is defined around that that paradigm. Not trying, that's a no-no in the Flores house. <laughs> you gotta try. Yeah. And if you don't, then but but you know, success is simply trying for sure. Thank Flores. you, Sydney, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You're a great interviewer. You're a great interviewer. You're making me sweat here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> She does kind of rock, doesn't she? I have to tell you. She does. She's a great um, job. So, uh, Mr. Flores, uh, Sydney, thank you so much for coming in and helping us moderate. Um, it's wonderful to see you. Mr. Flores, It was. It, it's a, quite a pleasure to have hosted you. Thank you so much for bringing your talent, your experience, your time. Um, I was really uh, pleased to hear about your time at an Ivy. I thought that must have been great to go from where you went to, to Massachusetts and, you know, just try to just the culture shock. I was just kind of picturing that too. Um, so uh, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Glendale Unified School District's Adelante Latinos. Um, right now, uh, for everybody as closing remarks, uh, please remember coming in November, on November 6th, we have uh, our partnership with the Glendale Library. We're having a Dia de los Muertos uh, a celebration at the library from three to seven. We'll have some performing arts groups from our various high schools. Uh, we also will have different ofrenda created by different groups within the community including our different high schools who will be uh, creating those altars for you to share at our central library also uh glendale community college if you just need more hispanic heritage month and who doesn't right exactly so uh, glendale community college has their um 
uh, their own website for the next few days uh, to, to give you more information uh, and uh, the, the celebration and the things that they have to share with us. Uh, we really want to thank everybody for this amazing month that we've had of Hispanic heritage. And uh, we love it. And we, we, we will see you next year. And uh, we want to thank you, Mr. Flores. Thank you for being our thank final you. speaker. We really appreciate you very much. Um, I should have warned you at the beginning. Uh, once I hit the off button, it's all going to shut down. So I'd like to thank you. And I'll follow up with you shortly via email. Everybody, thank you very much for attending. Have a really great evening. Thank you so much and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.